I practice in nuclear medicine at Stanford. We switched to PYL in 2018 because at my institution, our ethics committee decided, and I think rightfully so, that patients should not pay for a research scan. So there are more than 450 patients who were scanned since then did not have any out-of-pocket costs for these PSMA scans. Um, the kit for PSMA 11 is still undergoing FDA review. So that will come as well. But as of now, PYL is the only one available countrywide in the United States. And there are many efforts by the company behind it, by the professional society, the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, by other professional groups to organize training for physicians. So if you think of a, a general radiology exam, like a radiograph or a computer tomography scan, a CT scan, you have x-rays coming from outside of you and detectors on the other side. And so we take pictures of what your body stops or what it allows to pass through. So that, that's x-ray use. In nuclear medicine, we target a specific molecular process, hence the molecular in molecular imaging, and we attach a small amount of radioactivity, either fluorine-18, gallium-68, or either other isotopes. And these are injected, so the radiation comes from within the patient, not from outside. And we follow biological processes, molecular processes, as they happen. And so that's the molecular imaging part of it. And these days, modern molecular imaging is coupled with anatomical image. So that's why you have PET, positron emission tomography, together with CT in PET-CT, or together with MRI in PET-MRI. Or on general nuclear medicine, we have SPECT, single photon emission computed tomography, coupled with CT. So these days, it's very rare in advanced centers to have just molecular imaging on its own. We get a lot of knowledge from the anatomical information from CT or MRI, and that helps us improve the accuracy of the diagnosis. I like to use it. If you think of, of these receptors on cancer cells as door locks, the, the ligand is the key that goes into the door lock and opens it, right? Attached to this key, which can be a peptide, can be an antibody, it can be another small molecule, you have a chelator. So that's a linker between the key and, and the isotope, the radioactive material. And you can use the radioactive material for imaging, such as gallium-68, fluorine-18, copper-64. And if something lights up, if you find the key and you un unlock it, if you find the lock and you unlock it with the key, then you can use the same compound, the same ligand, now with a more powerful form of radiation, such as lutetium-177, copper-67, actinium-225 for treatment. So that gets a little bit into what's now described as theranostics, the company of the combination of therapy and diagnostics. But I think the easiest thing of thinking about it is this concept of having a lock, having a key, and then attaching to it one radiation for imaging. If you see something, you treat it with a different type of radiation. And I think that we need to be careful how we use these treatments, including PSMA. There are patients who will not benefit, right? And you should know ahead of it because of cost and side effects. FDG is ubiquitous, right? You can get it anywhere and it's relatively cheap. So I think that doing FDG prior to deciding on a PSMA treatment makes a lot of sense. As far as GRPR, first of all, they're all just research right now. Biology is very complex. And, and as some more senior colleagues of mine used to say, you know, biology has a way of messing things up for you. When you think you've got it, you have to go back to square one. And that's why it's called re. Homocysteine is a generic class of receptors that are part of this class of GRPR. RM2, it's one of the molecules, one of the keys that finds this lock, GRPR. RM2 has been used for a number of years. Another one is called NEO-B. It's also in the same class of antagonists. There are others in development. So um, the good thing is that the field is now exciting, not just to academia, but also to the industry. And there are many companies that are taking advantage of, of this, uh, no pun intended, but scintillating uh, environment for us. <laughs> and, and so there's a lot of investment. It will take a couple of years for us to get a sense of where will this class of agents work and also where it will not work. At more advanced stage of disease and biochemical recurrence, at that point, PET-CT is as good because you need a fast throughput. You know, with digital PET-CT, you can get an exam done in under 10 minutes. Given the duration of MRI, a PET-MRI, it's 
30, 45, maybe up to one hour. Mm. So again, we have access to new technology. We need to learn how to use it judiciously. I think that for many patients, PSMA is able to find almost the entire extent of disease. It is a very good molecule. So, I, But you're right. Once you get to a certain size, the spatial resolution of the machines is gets blurry. So the signal kind of washes out in the background for small lesions. What we see is a combination of the physical resolution, which is determined by the machine, but also the concentration of the agent so you can, what I'm trying to say is you can have a two millimeter lesion with very concentrated signal that will light up and will light up easier or, or better on a digital scan. And you can have a one centimeter lesion with very little concentration that will not have signal on this. So I, I, I think that again, it's biology. So we're learning uh, definitely for low PSA values, having the scan done on a digital scanner may, makes a big impact.